to uh, invite back up John to uh, have a conversation with Mark Brooks. And uh, after that, we'll have uh, about half an hour or so for a, uh, for a break. Short King session. Damn right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was looking around. Kelsey said great shoes on his way out. I was looking around, and I'm pretty sure 50 to 60% of everyone here is wearing white sneakers. Uh, it's definitely a vibe. All right, welcome to the stage, Mark Brooks. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so Mark, uh, Mark is the president and COO of Permanent Equity, which I'm going to be honest, I'm not totally sure what that means inside your business model. So I'm excited to understand a little bit more about what you do every day. Um, and Mark is a criminally underfollowed Twitter content creator, uh, criminally underfollowed. He's, you are personally one of my favorite follows. And I, I constantly think it's hilarious because I, I have these like light bulb moments in my life and my career and I post about them on Twitter and I see that you like have a much better thought out version of what I said and it was like four years ago that you put it up there. So I was like, dang it, I just need to really just study your Twitter more. Um, but I'm so grateful you, you've joined us here today. Yeah, happy to do it. Okay. So I, I've, I have a, a series of questions mainly inspired by the things that you've talked about openly on Twitter. Before we get there, I really do want to understand what the day-to-day -day looks like for you every day. I think I have an idea, but I'd love for you to share that. Yeah, so uh, permanent equity is uh, a fund model. So we actually, we started, I don't think Brent would have used these words, but we started as a, as a mini hold co of media businesses, uh, an agency, a media company, uh, a PR company, um, and then, uh, through some interactions on Twitter, uh, Brent got convinced to take other people's money and, and start a fund. So we're now managing businesses inside of uh, two funds, Fund 1, which is $50 million, and Fund 2, which is about $300 million. Um, and we're about halfway invested on, uh, on Fund 2. So our, uh, the permanent equity uh, team is really split into two. So there's the, there's the deal side and there's the operations side. So the deal side, uh, Emily, who was here last year, I think, um, is kind of on the, on the vanguard of that, going out and looking for opportunities. Tim, our other co-president and chief investment officer, kind of runs that, that team. Um, and then on the operations side, uh, our job is really to be um, helpers for our portfolio companies uh, in whatever way that, that requires. So we have um, folks who work in an operating partner role. So that's a, um, a role that is meant to be really a true partner to the CEOs and the leadership teams of our, of our businesses. So um, we, don't do, uh, we don't do quarterly board meetings. We don't do board decks. We like to do weekly conversations for 30 to 60 minutes with, uh, with each of our leaders. So the operating partner really takes that role. And so they're kind of uh, the partner to the CEO Everything from, you know, what are we thinking about three to five years from now down to I need somebody to yell at because my warehouse manager didn't show up for a third day in a row um, and everything in between. Uh, so that's the operating partner role. And then what we're working on doing is building out other functions internally that we think we can be helpful with. So Kelly Morgan is part of our team. Her full-time job is talent. Uh, so she is... Uh, for um, roles where the business doesn't necessarily have the internal capability or wherewithal to do a national level search for uh, a leadership position or high level sales position, that sort of thing, Kelly is the one who plugs into that process and, and works for them. Um, I think she placed 16 uh, director level and higher folks in our businesses last year. So that is her, that is her full time job is finding great people for our uh, portfolio companies and for the, the firm as well. Uh, and then we have um, Johnny, who is head of strategic projects. So we uh, stole him from Boston Consulting Group. And so uh, like Kelly does with talent, where it kind of goes above the internal capabilities, he's the one that's taking on project work that goes above the and beyond the internal capabilities of the business. So um, an ERP implementation or looking to stand up a new HR platform or doing uh, some major change manage management in terms of realigning departments, Johnny will take on that, that sort of work. So that's, that's one part of operations, kind of what you'd think of as classic operations. And then we also consider finance and accounting part of operations as well. So um, Nikki, who joined our team at the beginning of this year, 
um, is amazing. She's our CFO, and she leads a team of financial partners um, who report to her. And then uh, they, uh, those financial partners then hook into the financial leadership inside of the port codes. So we have kind of this dual hook-in structure where the CEO is meeting on the regular with an operating partner. The financial partner is, uh, is directly connected to the financial leader, whether that's the director of finance controller, could just be like an APAR person. Um, and they're the ones that are doing a lot of the internal analysis, passing it back to the operating partner, collaborating with them on where we have opportunities or potentially threats, and then relaying that information back to the portfolio company as well. So they kind of operate as an, as an external financial expert for that uh, company as well. So, uh, my, uh, I'm very blessed because my job is to get to work with all those amazing people uh, doing all that stuff. So, uh, and the way that we think about our job, we actually stole from um, one of our construction businesses. Uh, they have uh, they have three um, they have three kind of uh, mantras, um, but the last one is be a helper. And it's so, it's so simple. And for those of you that know construction, like having a sub that's willing to actually help other subs, you know, hand off jobs or uh, that sort of thing, like it's very, it's very rare. So they have really differentiated themselves in their space by being a helper. And that's what we strive to do on the operations team too. Like uh, you'll notice from looking at our portfolio, there's really no consistency in the types of things that we invest in. We want to invest in businesses that know how to make money because we believe they're going to continue to make money. And uh, we never aspire to be the industry brains behind whatever it is they're doing. I'm not going to know commercial waterproofing better than Dan. I'm not going to know pool building better than James. I'm not going to know executive matchmaking better than Courtney. Um, but what we can do is add value in the areas of you know, banking, legal, finance, um, HR, compensation structures, that, that sort of thing. So we are trying to, as they are out in front of the company, really leading it from an industry perspective, we are coming alongside and trying to be good helpers to them. I feel like that was a great explanation. Thank you. Yeah. I <laughs> hope it wasn't too long. No, I, I thought it was great. And I think a, a lot of people, um, I, I heard this specific question yesterday, it was like four or five times. And it was, everyone coming here, has an idea of what shared services should look like, this is not what we're going to spend our time together on. I, I have so much things I want to ask you yeah. specifically about. But, um, but the, the shared services thing is just interesting, and everyone is constantly experimenting with like centralized, decentralized, centralized, decentralized. It, that's usually exactly what, you know. Uh, ours was centralized, then decentralized, and we're like, wow, that's really hard. We should go back to centralized, and that's even harder, so then we should go decentralized. Uh, so quickly, because I want to get to the, to the better stuff, the yeah. good stuff, is how, what is the line for, for you guys? Because from my perspective, that sounds pretty involved, in a good way, but involved in the portfolio company. Yeah, and we, I mean, we get, we get involved, it's really more episodic, like we, we do try to, we try to be there the, on our weekly, bi-weekly calls, we're really more of like counselor, confidant, consultant, uh, and um, we will plug in on individual projects. Uh, but we, we try, we, we work very hard to not be a lasting operational presence inside the business. So the types of services that we want to set up at permanent equity um, tend to be ones that they can go out to the market and find elsewhere. You can work with a recruiting company. You can work with a, you know, a management consulting firm. But we want to set up, set those up um, for our businesses to use because we think we can do them better because we know them deeply and intimately, know what they're looking for, know their culture very well. So we can be a great first first pass at, at those sorts of things. Um, so that's the that's the way we we think about it. Um, we also aspire, uh, and this is kind of an idea that we stole from uh, from Coke Industries. So they um, Coke. Uh, a, an accountant is never going to run their accounting function. And a finance person is never going to run their finance function. They have business owners who are running each of those functions because every department at Coke has the option of either using the in-house option or going outside if they can find better service, better pricing. So just like everything at Coke, it's very market driven. Uh, and so we, we aspire to do the same thing where we tell them, hey, if you wanna use someone else to hire this person, you're very welcome to do it. 
And uh, who knows, maybe someday Kelly is taking on outside, Kelly and her team are taking on outside work as well. I would, I would love that. Um, and I think it creates that kind of natural market competition that forces you to actually do a good job because when you're, when you're forcing people to use you, it makes you lazy. Uh, and so if you're forced to compete with other people out in the market to provide that service at a reasonable price, I think it, uh, it kind of forces excellence. And my last question on this, just to make sure that I understand it, yeah. you charge for those services provided? Uh, we're still, yeah, we're still, uh, just to be candid, we're still working on that. Um, we do a the better job of it on hiring, um, and we charge a pretty deep discount to what the market rate is, um, but it covers all of Kelly's costs, which is kind of what we're, we're, what we're trying to do is um, not make it a profit center, but have it be have it be something where we can cover our, our costs and continue to add those services. We're getting better at it on the strategic project side with Johnny, um, and then the uh, the operating partner financial partner stuff is kind of rolled into the the management fee that's part of the deal. Yeah. Okay, that that makes sense. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Okay, so this is a selfish uh, moment for me because I love following you on Twitter so much. I was like, this is going to be great. I'm going to get him up on stage, and I can just ask him whatever I want so that I can use this in my own business. <laughs> so this is uh, very selfish. Um, so I, I have a couple of topics here that you talk about frequently. And I, I really want to understand, uh, one, why you talk about them so frequently. So you must understand something that I don't understand about this topic. Yep. Uh, because it's, so, it, it's clearly consuming brain space. Um, and, and diving into them as, as much as we can here. So the first one... Uh, it, it's a relatively simple concept, but you talk about it a lot. And I'm like, okay, there's something here that I don't understand how he's looking at this. And it's the concept of time. Like m a, a majority of your uh, content r is speaking very regularly about time and how to speed up, uh, similar to what Xavier said when he was on stage, how do we pull forward five years or 10 years of time? Yeah. Um, so... I think the way I uh, the way I think about it is um, it's nothing new. Time is the scarcest resource that w that we have, uh, and I'm I'm very conscious of that. Um, in the business world, I also have uh, four kids. I have a sophomore in high school um, who I get like two more summers with, uh, and that's a that's just a kind of a you know gut punch of a of a realization. Um, and so I I do think a lot about time. Um, I think just because, especially the the younger you are, the harder it is to realize what is slipping through your fingers as you're uh, just as you're living day to day life, and so uh, I I believe that um, we we have made up things like money um, to be containers for time. So we are we're bottling up time and exchanging it through money, exchanging it through services. Um, you know, the first uh, you know we were on. The barter system, I spent my time growing wheat, you spent your time raising sheep, we decided to trade the time that we, uh, that we spent doing, uh, doing those activities. Um, so I think time is, uh, is extremely important. I think as you, are, um, as you start to look at managing multiple businesses, one of the important concepts uh, is actually, I got from a cartoon, so XKCD, uh, I don't know if you guys know that one, um, but a uh, super brilliant uh, guy uh, who um, has a science background um, and does these really clever cartoons. They're all like stick figure types of things. He wrote this, uh, he wrote this chart, and there's a ton of math behind it, which is, um, helps you decide how much time you can spend automating something in order to save you time over time. So it's a, you know, it's a two, it's a two by two kind of a thing. And uh, I share that with everybody on my team. I tweet it every once in a while because it's a great reminder about, um, you know, sometimes we, f we feel like we're doing something over and over again. And so we go really deep and we spend like a week automating it. And then we realize that thing is like, okay, I only do that like once a month and it takes me like 15 minutes. I just wasted an entire week of my time automating something that I don't do that often. And then there are things that we don't think about that we're actually doing over and over again. Um, so I think um, to, to wrap up a little bit, the thing that I, uh, that I think helps um, help us think about time is to actually step out of our day-to-day -day on, on a regular basis and just think about what we're doing. 
And uh, I know the sound, it sounds insane because I know that the stuff that all of you are going through, it seems crazy to like stop doing the stuff that actually needs to be done in the business. Um, but I use a lot of time blocking in my, uh, in my personal agenda. Um, and I will have blocks of time during the week just to step out and think, okay, what is the next big unlock for this business? I'm gonna spend 30 minutes thinking about our picture frame business and think about what's the next big growth unlock for them. So I think, for, I think to be able to conceptualize where you're spending your time, how you can be spending your time better, you kind of have to step outside of time, step outside of your, your regular day to day and challenge yourself to think, you know, to kind of look down at yourself um, in a uh, you know in kind of a weird way and say okay how am I how am I spending my time is this the optimal use of my time and not only that but is this the optimal use of my natural gifts so I believe everybody's got their own kind of portfolio of gifts that they're born with that they are nurtured with um, uh, through childhood is this the right way for me to be spending my time or is it time for me to hand this off and this off and this off most of the time in in leadership. Uh, the answer is yes. You should be you should be handing things off, um, and I know a lot of you are at a scale right now where you got to do everything. As you grow, you're going to have to have the discipline to let go of things because you are not the best person to own each of those things, and it's a really hard uh, discipline to uh, to do. Um, but I, I challenge you to keep thinking about, keep kind of auditing the way that you use your time, auditing the way that you use your gifts to make sure that you maximize it. So. How do you coach the the leaders that you're working with? I mean, I'm sure I need this lecture more than anybody else. You know, there's a there's a picture of me painting our warehouse floors a couple weeks ago in my painting Lulus. No, John. Yeah, bad John. I know. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> right. so how are you working with these leaders aside from you know challenging them exactly like you just said? Is there another like further step that you're taking to help people assess their time management? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's challenging, and it's it's especially challenging when you have uh, someone who's a bit of a business polyglot. Like they can do lots and lots of things. Uh, thinking um, in particular of uh, the chief operating officer of one of our businesses, brilliant guy, super smart, um, knows everything from manufacturing, you know, all the way through like the nitty gritty details of the Amazon platform. But he has way too much. He's a he's a blocker for the for the growth of the business. Um, and he's probably going to be better. Uh, well, I can guarantee he's going to be better than the person that he hands it off to, at least at the beginning. So delegation is uh, being willing to take a slower, messier, lower quality option at the beginning, and then to step back and continue giving high level feedback to that person until they get better and better and better. And if you've got the right person, because they have more bandwidth to focus on that one thing than you do, they will eventually surpass you. And this is how we this is how we grow businesses is by delegation and delegation and delegation. And delegation feels like feels like letting go. It feels like loss. It feels like accepting a worse solution. You know, it's very rare when you've got someone who you like know you, is going to do better than you immediately. Um, usually, they aren't. And, uh, but the whole idea is making, making it someone's sole focus gives you the runway to make it excellent. Uh, whereas if you're holding everything so tight, like, I don't know, painting the floor of your warehouse, uh, you know, it, free, it frees you up to do, uh, to do the, the bigger picture thinking about the business. I mean, ultimately, um, I would imagine most of you are here, even though you wouldn't call yourself this, you've got some visionary bug in you. You've got a big idea. Uh, that you want to pursue, and that uh, the the most difficult spot for a visionary bug to flourish is when you're bogged down in details. Those are antithetical to each other. So, in order to give your visionary uh, brain a chance to expand, you have to be constantly looking for ways to hand things off, whether that's to to people, whether it's outsourcing. Lots of things can be done through AI now. Um, so always be challenging yourself to hand things off, to hand things off, to hand things off. This, I mean, this really leads perfectly. It's almost like we practiced it. Uh, into we my did not, by yeah, the way. No, we did not. This is great, <laughs> yeah. though. Yeah. Uh, into my next uh, question, which is this concept of growing teams by growing people. Um, I have a couple comments, but I feel like you can just start right off. 
No, I want you to go. I want you to go first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Give me the prompt. So uh, every organization here has a people problem, right? We all, that's that's the definition of an organization. <laughs> uh, so we all have a people problem, and it usually manifests in our attempts to grow and hire new leaders. So you know, one of my biggest personal journeys over the last year has been uh, developing not just our top leaders, the top three people in the org chart, but the 10 to 15 people that report to them and hiring new, uh, new roles inside there and figuring out what that looks like and what's the scope of vision, what's the core focus every day for these, uh, for these new leaders to be focusing on. And it, I mean, it's been a, a journey uh, for me and that, we're, that I feel like we're just starting. And when I talk to most of my peers that have businesses our size, most people sort of go on this like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna build a leadership academy, which is good and I think that's amazing but it usually doesn't get traction. And if, and if that's not the answer, maybe that is the answer, then how should executives be thinking about growing their people so that their teams continue, can continue to scale? Like, what is a way to get traction? There? Yeah, um, so let me talk about a couple of, couple of conceptual things and then try to answer the question. So I think the, the first one is um, that management uh, managing people is not a is not a promotion. It is a different career. So there, we have this idea of uh, you're going to be junior thing, and then you're going to be senior thing, and then you're going to be manager of thing, and that's like a logical progression. It's not. It's garbage. Uh, you can be junior thing, and you can be senior thing, but as soon as you become manager of thing, that's a completely different set of skills. I would I would argue. So uh, there's there's this. Um, this principle that we that we try to think about a lot, which is um, the difference between a manager and a principal. Sorry, different principle. Uh, so managers and principals, where principals are, uh, their growth is like this, and a manager's growth is like this. So you have you have growth for a principal in depth of knowledge on a particular subject matter. And growth for managers is growth and breadth of knowledge about lots of different things, so they can so they can pull things together. So um, we often take someone who is on a principal track, who's uh, you know they're the best at this thing. This is Peter Principle, right? Um, 1969 book. Um, you know, people get promoted until they're not qualified anymore. Um, and I would argue that as soon as someone gets promoted out of an individual contributor role into a manager role, they're already unqualified, unless you've been doing lots of management training. Uh, so the ability to help people prioritize and uh, to coach them on how to be a good worker um, and all these sorts of things, they're, um, they're kind of antithetical to that principal track where you want depth. Um, so, second concept um, is I, I think this is a, a, a big driver of why um, we have so much micromanagement in the workplace uh, is because we're promoting uh, principles into manager roles. So, principles have gotten to be experts in their area because they have honed exactly what it is they're doing over time. And so, when you ask them to manage lots of people, doing that same role, all they're thinking about is the depth that they have created doing it this one particular way over many, many years. And making that mental shift to being able to manage people towards an outcome and not a particular process is a very difficult, uh, you know, mental gymnastics to do. And if you think about it, like we are, um, we are measured on individual performance from the day that we are born all the way through high school, all the way through college, if you, uh, if you go to college, um, in your first several jobs, you're, managed, you're measured on your individual performance. And then all of a sudden you become a manager and you're not measured on your individual performance at all, you're measured on the individual performance of all the people on your team, like the team performance. So there's this, there's this like radical shift of economics that has to happen in your brain as a manager of people that is completely antithetical to everything that's been drilled into you as an individual contributor for, you, for your entire life. And don't get me started on like group projects in high school and college, those are BS, I think we all know that. It's usually driven by one person and it was probably most of you in this room. Uh, so uh, I think, that, um, I think those, 
those two things, so like the principal manager conundrum and being measured on individual contribution versus group contribution, those two, those two concepts are, make it very difficult to have this, to have this shift. In terms, of, um, in terms of how to do it, I think um, you know, we, we consider that level of coaching a big part of our job as we're working with the, with the CEOs. So I'm still, I have, a, um, you know, I have a lot of people who are the CEO because they were the best person in the, the plant or in the field or something, you know, they like came up out of, um, you know, out of do, doing the actual work. And so a, a lot of that, a lot of that coaching happens in those regular conversations. Um, we don't have a, a leadership academy now, but what we do is um, we get our uh, our CEOs together, uh, even though they're from radically different, excuse me, industries. And we have a few talks on uh, you know topics like doing you know performance assessments or um, you know personality assessments. Um, somebody will talk about uh, you know a, a particular case study that they've had in their in their business that sort of thing. And really, what we uh, we find some great growth in our leaders when they just spend time with each other. So I would I would echo what Sieva said. Like this is a this is a great place to get to know other people. Is a great way to to hone your skills, um, but. Uh, I'm I'm not going to be able to answer your questions super well on on how to do it because we're still we're still figuring that out as well. I haven't found like an external management training thing at scale that I would uh, that I would heartily endorse. So really for us, it's just kind of it's still one on one work with the with the CEOs and then encouraging them to to push it down to their teams. In those, uh, what's the cadence of those meetings where you bring all your, all of your leaders together? Uh, so those, um, we had our first in-person version back in April. So we brought everybody to Columbia, Missouri um, and did that. And um, we are now doing quarterly lunch and learns since then. So we're all getting on Teams or Zoom. And someone is coming with an idea that they want to talk about for the first 30 minutes. We do some kind of some Q&A for 15 minutes. And then 15 minutes is just kind of open forum at the end. Um, and it's interesting to hear what kind of conversations come out of that. Like it's everything from... <laughs> Uh, the price of aluminum to uh, you know to like tricky people issues and how how people are dealing with people not showing up for interviews and and that sort of thing. So we find you know creating a cohort uh, and if you're still small and you have you know one business two businesses, encouraging them to go find a cohort outside uh, to um, to link up with I think can be great uh, growth opportunity also. I I was reading Scale Up a few weeks ago and. Um one of the things they talk about there, which was kind of interesting, was, was this, like a lunch and learn basically, but almost every day, where you sit down and it's this, uh, you know, the communion, the breaking bread with your, your co-leaders mm -hmm. that helped everyone to flourish. And we've been accidentally doing that for a while, but there was no additional uh, education on top of that. Yeah, I mean, Daily, I think teacher is like one of the hardest jobs out there. So I don't know that I could do daily. Uh, quarterly is a pretty good cadence for me. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, like, like a lot of these things, I think I um, said this a, a few months back in a conversation with um, Michael Girdley. It's like the, the, the older you get, the more experience you get, the, the more and more your answer is going to be it depends. Like it just, you just learn that there's, there's nothing formulaic. So for each of your businesses, it's, the answer is probably going to be different, I would guess. The next thing I want to dive into, and this is really, this is following a great path here, which is the distribution of decision making. So we, we figure out how to coach people on their time and their time management. We, we figure out how to help them grow and we're helping them grow into better decision making so that we can delegate and, can, and continue to scale. Mm -hmm. So can you walk me through how you're thinking about the delegation of meaningful decision making? Yeah. So we use, um, we use a framework called DACI or RACI, D-A-C-I or R-A-C-I. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, but the, uh, the roles, it basically gives you role definition through different types of uh, decisions. So the D stands for driver. Um, the A stands for approver. The C uh, stands for contributor. And the I stands for informed. Uh, and so for each type of decision, you're assigning those roles. So let me talk about each of them really quickly. So uh, it starts with D, but the A is actually, the approver is actually the person who is the final decision maker in the, uh, in the process. So who is, who is making the call? 
Um, so as an example for us, when we're first getting started with a new business, um, we have a very clear DACI conversation on major capital outlays. And so that can differ based on the size of the business, the level of OPEX, that sort of thing. So anything under, you know, for example, anything under $50,000, like we don't want to be consulted. Um, or, uh, you know, a major capital expenditure is a capital heavy business, like don't contact us of anything, you know, a capital expenditure under 200,000 bucks. Like that's, that's for you to decide. Um, and then over $200,000, that's a different, DACI framework. So the approver is the person who is making the final call. The driver, which can be kind of a uh, confusing role, but the driver is the person whose job it is to move the decision-making process along. So they are not making the call. They're not necessarily even contributing to the conversation. They're essentially the project manager for moving the, moving the decision through its steps. Contributors are people who um, have uh, the right to be consulted on, uh, on a major decision, but they don't actually make the call. And then your informed people are the ones who, you, you let them know the details, but they are not contributing to the decision and they're certainly not making the decision. So for each type of major decision in the business, we lay out this DACI framework and actual names go in each of those boxes. Um, there's, there can only be one name in the A there can only be one name in the D, because otherwise things get super confusing. So only one driver, only one approver. There can be multiple contributors, and there are usually many multiple informed people who need to know about the, about the decision. So, that's, uh, so really, it's on, a, it's on a subject matter basis. So we do it for hiring, and a lot of times we'll do it hiring above this salary level versus below the salary level, capital expenditures above and below. Um, those sorts of major decisions in the in the life of a of a business, and then for the ones that do that do come from us, we we uh, where we're the approver, um, we really try to make that as open and collaborative as possible. We try to avoid uh, even if we have decision rights on a particular decision, we never want that to feel like we are going behind the curtain and then we're coming out with a decision because that's, to our prior topic, that's a lost education opportunity to teach them how we think. So I encourage um, you know, managers and, and leaders to invite people into meetings that maybe they don't belong in so that they can hear the decision-making process. We want our leaders to hear our you know, permanent equity uh, decision-making process as well. So if it's a major decision, we will usually write, we do a lot of writing, we will write something up for them and send it over to them or do a longer conversation. We never want to deliver you know, the Ten Commandments from on high without a ton of explanations to how we arrived at them. Um, because that misses the educational opportunity of teaching them how we decide what we what we decide. So that's uh, just a quick recap. That's how we do decision rights: DACI, driver, approver, contributor, informed. And we find that that makes everything pretty clear for everybody. And we have far fewer missteps when we've established that for particular types of decisions in the life of the business. What did the R stand for? Uh, R is a it's a, just a different D. Uh, and I don't. It's some uh, some people use racy. I can't remember why they use uh, <laughs> they use it. Does anybody does, does anybody know what the R is versus the D? Responsible. responsible. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, responsible versus driver. Yeah. And so it, this is only meaningful decisions. Yeah. I, I, um, I mean, we every decision's meaningful, John. <laughs> uh, uh, but I. Um, it's it's really only for major decisions. Like we. Um, so we have, uh, we have 14 businesses, um, Lord willing it'll be 16 uh, by the end of October, and uh, we are a team of 18 people uh, in Columbia. We couldn't run these businesses if we wanted to. And so we are, uh, we are all about building high trust relationships with great operators and letting them go do their thing. So in the beginning, uh, when, we're, when we're first starting to meet with them, um, those weekly, bi-weekly meetings will be a little bit more formulaic because we're trying to tease information out. We kind of ask like, okay, what went well this week? What didn't go well? What are you excited about? What are you nervous about? How can we help? Those are kind of like our five key questions. Uh, but 
uh, the relationships that go well, within a couple months, we're not asking any of those questions. They're the ones that are setting the agenda and they're coming to us and saying, I need help with this and I want some help thinking through this and you know, what can you tell me about this? And that's, that's way better than us asking our, our formulate questions. So the, the idea is like 99% of the decisions in the business we want, we want our leadership to make, and we want them to feel total ownership over that, which is why incentive alignment is so important. Um, so we want them out there making those decisions. There are, there are things that we have experience with uh, that we want some decision rights around, because if you, if you make a bad decision on that front, then you can get really hosed. So, um, you know, any, um, a job for a, like for a subcontractor, uh, any job that we're signing that's over three million bucks, we would like to take a look at the contract. Um, anyone who is, uh, you know, signing a new line of credit, we'd love to, you know, um, we'd love to have signatory rights on, on that. So really these kind of key um, things where you have the potential to bet the business we want to be involved in in those decisions. The other important decisions that are that have to do more with the day to day operation of the business, we're more than happy to let them own. Back on growing people, uh, it's obviously the same topic, really. Are you helping drive this decision making framework through each of these organizations? Yeah, when it's helpful. Um, it's, it's helpful for us because the, the handoffs between, you know, a lot of these businesses that we are buying have been family owned for such a long time. So having any sort of ownership group that isn't working in the business is a very foreign concept. So it's really more important for us in that, uh, in that handoff of, uh, of decision making. For businesses that are large enough, yeah, we've helped them think through Daisy, you know, businesses that have multiple departments, that, that sort of thing, um, it, it can be helpful. Um, what we find, though, is um, a lot of these businesses have been around long enough, 40, 50, 60 years, that their own framework is already there and that accountability is already there. And it doesn't make sense for us to come in with like a buzzwordy thing for a bunch of blue collar folks and blow up their lives with it. Like that's the worst thing that we could do. So we try to, um, we try to be hands off where we feel like things are clicking. But when we do uh, you know, see like inefficiencies or um, you know, some bad decision making, that sort of thing, we will come in and try to help facilitate. So we, we've talked about time, yep. we've talked about growing people, mm -hmm. we've talked about delegating decisions, and, and the last one's sort of the culmination of this. Uh, you, t you tweeted about this, I think, the other day, but it, it's the creative, destru creative destruction. Yeah. So like, hey, so we've spent all this time, we've like, we've figured out how to allocate their time, we've helped develop them as individuals, we've given them real decision making authority, and now how does that pair in with letting them break everything so that we can cr creatively move forward? Yeah, um, it's a really hard culture to create, um, I think. And I think it said something last night uh, that was like the um, new, businesses, new businesses arise through disruption. Therefore, your job security in those businesses is incumbent on your ability to disrupt things. And then over time, uh, old businesses tend to be predicated on maintenance uh, and stasis, and therefore job security inside of those businesses is based on maintenance and stasis. And I think that the challenge is if you're, uh, if you're standing still, you're dying. And uh, if, you're, um, if you're out there uh, you know, in the marketplace, somebody's gonna eat your lunch. Uh, and so it may as well be you. Like, uh, so you have to, creating this culture where People are um, incentivized to challenge things and break things down. Um, I think it was Bezos that first talked about the, the stacked S-curves in a, in a business. So um, the, the S-curve, your, your first S-curve of growth, and then your second S-curve, you know, whatever, uh, whatever your second act is, doesn't start here at the end of the first S-curve. It starts way down here. So you're, you're having to actively break your business over and over again in order to get on that next S curve to grow it over time. And uh, so building those cultures um, that where, uh, you know, where destruction, creative destruction can happen is critical to building a long-term successful enterprise. And I think really the, f the first step in, in creating that culture is letting people know, making dissent safe. 
And uh, that requires a lot of emotional maturity from, from leadership, their willingness to be questioned, um, their grace with people who question them in stupid ways, because they are gonna get a lot of stupid questions about, about things. So being gracious with those people in a way where they feel like they can continue to come back and ask those challenging questions of, of management. So um, I think one of the best examples I've seen of this, I got to um, work at The Motley Fool for a long time. David Gardner, one of the co-founders, had this uh, concept called Top It. Uh, so you were, you were welcome to criticize whatever you wanted in the business, as long as you were prepared to top it. So there's no like trashing other people without coming with a better idea, right? So you can, uh, you can question, you can push back, but I also have this idea about how to, how to make this better. And I think if you can create a top it culture, you can, you can generate uh, lots of good ideas, you can generate uh, you know, the desired behavior of people pointing out weaknesses and potential problems down the line, but you do it in a healthy, constructive sort of a way uh, where you're challenging them to, okay, this is, this is broken, but instead of just like crapping all over the person who owns this process, I actually have to do the work to think about how I would do it better. And maybe I'll talk to this person because they're actually involved in that department and talk to them about how it works first, and then I'll come with my, with my top it idea. So I think that kind of top it culture is a great way to get started uh, because you really need people um, who are, you know, the, uh, the Toyota way are encouraged to pull the red cord, right? When they see when they see something broken, or when they see something that might break down the road, that's how you're going to continue to be able to disrupt yourself and stay ahead of the competition. And are you attempting to implement? Like, how do you even implement tactically? Like, I, I'm I'm thinking through my own business. I'm like, all right, top it. That, that sounds really cool. How on Thursday am I going to walk in and be like, hey, everybody? <laughs> Top yeah, it. top of time. <laughs> yeah, top, top of time. Of time everybody. Let's go. What do you mean you don't know what that means? Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I think um, I, it really starts with the leadership, and um, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of times, and especially in small businesses, uh, the culture is the boss is the one that has all the ideas. Like it's not my job to have ideas; it's just my idea to go out. My job to go out and do the work. And so um, having, having people um, be problem solvers in addition to like doing their day-to-day -day work is incumbent on the leader making that space safe and being willing to say, John as the leader, hey, we've got this thing that I'm trying to figure out and I can't figure it out. Like how can you, how can you help me with this? Um, I saw, uh, gosh, I wish I could remember who this was uh, on Twitter, I think it was yesterday. Um, there is a, a plumbing business who is trying to figure out how to more efficiently install inline water heaters. Did you see this? This is so smart. So one of his plumbers came up with this idea, and this is like, this is creative destruction. He came up with this idea where they built the entire assembly for, uh, for the filter and uh, the water heater on a piece of three quarter inch plywood that they had painted black. So they built the whole thing inside the shop and then all they did was throw it in the truck, they drilled it into the studs of the unfinished part of the house, plugged in one end, <laughs> plugged in the other end. There's like no install time in the house. There's no freaking way the CEO came up with that idea, right? That's, that comes from the field. And that kind of having, being willing to have meetings as the leader with the people who are actually doing the work and uh, challenging them and saying, hey look, you know this better than I am. Like that's the, 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 the real challenge of being small business leadership is everyone's looking to you to have the ideas, but your posture needs to be, I don't have any ideas. Like I'm just here to help coordinate. You are the ones that know what it's like in the field. You're the ones that know who, what it's like to interact with the customer when a pipe breaks, you know, whatever. So you tell me, like, wave your magic wand. What would you want to happen? And if you can get them to start sharing ideas with, well, th it really sucks when this happens. Okay, that's cool. Like, how would we head that off? You know, hey, guys, you know, everybody in the room. Um, and so just it, it starts with small steps like that and really it starts with the leadership's willingness to be humble and say I don't know how to solve this problem, but I know that you guys do so let's let's work it out together Yeah, yeah that was amazing. Also, I'm gonna be apparently going home and figuring out, you know, how to install water heaters There faster. you go. Yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, This was incredible um, 
our next step here is just going to be opening it up for questions for Mark. Yeah, great question. So the question was, um, what have we learned um, about the interactions between operating partners and CEOs and the balance between uh, coaching and accountability? Um, so I think the there are two main foundations that we that we focus on. Um, one is incentive alignment, like that's that's just base case got to be there. Uh, and it sounds um, it sounds simple. I'm going to pick at it just a little bit. Um, when I say when I say incentive alignment, I mean like drinking from the same soda straw, like absolute 100% incentive alignment. This is something we've had to learn painfully over time. So uh, permanent equity. Um, we don't charge our investors a management fee. Um, we share the profits. Uh, we share in the profits that our um, that our businesses generate. So if our businesses are not distributing cash, permanent equity doesn't get paid. Our investors don't get paid. So we want our CEOs to be incentivized on distributed cash, not EBITDA, not net income, like. Because those are, I mean, anyone that knows a little bit about finance knows those are wildly different things and they can be gamed in completely different ways. And uh, we've had relationships in the past where because of a historical employment arrangement or something like that, uh, they were incentivized on EBITDA, we were incentivized. So any anytime you start talking about financing or anything like that, your incentives get all out of whack and it gets to be really super messy. So I would say to the degree to the degree possible, make sure that your leadership is getting paid when you get paid through the you know and den denominated in the exact same way, and that will save you a ton of heartache and a ton of complicated conversations. And the second is trust. Um, incentives are really easy to set up up front, and trust is not. It just takes a, it takes a really long time, which is why I'm super grateful. Uh, Permanent Equity's got 30 years to uh, to do this thing because uh, trust just takes a long time. Um, and I think um, one of the one of the things that we find helpful is um, making sure that the CEOs feel supported um, in. Uh, in all their decision making and in all their efforts, and uh, I think we I think we assume we make the assumption that like when you have some modicum of business success, you don't need to be encouraged anymore. And I think a kind word to people still carries a ton of weight, even for a very experienced CEO. And so making sure that we are giving them positive reinforcing feedback when they make good decisions, uh, the purpose of which is one, it's just it's the right thing to do. Second is they know that you are for them and that you are cheering for them so that when you do have to have those hard coaching conversations, they know that it's from a position of you being for them and not you being in some adversarial relationship. So the, so the compensation bit, make sure that your incentives are aligned so you're not at cross purposes in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. And the trust bit, uh, lets them know that when you're coming with that hard conversation, they know that it's from a position of wanting them to be better and to and to succeed, and not from uh, a position of conflict. Yeah. So we have. Um, I, I should have mentioned. Thank you. It's a good question. So we have we have those weekly or biweekly meetings with the CEO, and then we have when uh, when the books are closed, we have a monthly finance meeting that includes all four of those people: the operating partner, the finance partner. And then at the at the business, the CEO and the financial leader. So that's that's our monthly kind of recalibration on on what everybody's seeing. Um, and I would say um, it's not an overstatement to say that at Permanent Equity we are ferociously back channeling on on information, and we trust that they're doing the same thing inside the business. So it's really. It's up to the two parties to make sure that they're in coordination, and then that monthly meeting is to make sure that yes, okay, we are all talking about the same thing, and when you have you know P and L variances, those aren't unexpected because the fi at least the financial partner knew about it, if not the operating partner. So that's kind of how we square that box. Uh, so the question is, when we when we see a, a manager about to make a mistake, do we um, do we step in in front of the train or you know force them to force them to make a different decision? Uh, it it depends on um, how how bad of a decision it's going to be. <laughs> so we uh, kind of have this mantra of um, test above the waterline, which is a um, just kind of a joke about a ship 
Um, it's fine to drill holes in a ship as long as those holes are above the water, <laughs> not below. Uh, so if it's a if it's a below the water line type of a decision, that's one where we will intervene and say, hey, no, and this is and this is why. Like always, always explaining why, taking that opportunity to coach them on on why. Um, most of the time, uh, those decisions are not going to be below the water line. They're going to be above. And it's really just an issue of timing. So if they want to take one approach to sales and we a sales hire, and we believe a different approach to a sales hire is actually going to be better long term, then that's that's one where we might let them see uh, for you know one of two reasons. One is it's a great learning opportunity for them, and two is we might be wrong. Like you know our uh, the you know our history there might not be great information for the type of decision that they're making, uh, so we try to be humble about about that as well. Uh, so um, really, it, it it depends, and um, do you know what we want to do? Um, uh, something that we're very clear on when we are at cross purposes on a decision like that is we just want to we want to measure. So let's decide on what metrics we're actually going to be measuring to decide whether or not this was a good decision and a time frame in which we're going to revisit it. So we made that different decision about uh, sales hiring. Okay, do you think six months is long enough for them to get their feet under them and start to see measurable results? Okay, great. Let's take a look. In six months, if they've moved the needle, you were right and we'll back off. In six months, if they haven't, then we're going to go in a different direction. And I think it, as long as you're establishing, uh, it's all about, man, it's all about like reality over expectations. So if you can set good expectations about what's going to happen uh, as a result of that decision-making process, then that subsequent conversation gets way easier because the expectations are set, the timing was set, and you can move on either in the same direction or a different direction. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mark, for coming on stage and helping us out.